Half a century ago, I landed in this country as a nine-year-old immigrant from Shanghai, China. And within a month, I found myself in a fifth grade classroom in West Philadelphia, struggling to learn a new language and being teased mercilessly by my peers. But I found shortly that the same kids who were teasing me started to come to me for help with math. And I realized then that math had power and that the power of math transcends cultures. Because when I flew across that ocean, my Chinese became useless here. But my math didn't skip a single beat, because as we all know, math is a universal language. So I've always been a firm believer that if you help a child build a solid foundation in math, it's the best vehicle that you can give them to help them cross any kind of boundaries that they may face. Now, I was trained as an electrical engineer for seven years. My job was to invent industrial controls. But in 1988, I was able to start my life's calling, and I released my first game related to math, which is called the 24 game. For 20 years, we did tournaments and ultimately impacted about 10 million kids worldwide. But in those 20 years, I was focused on two things. Number one, how do you get a child to take ownership of the learning process? Because if you don't do that, you're always going to be pulling teeth. Number two, once they make that decision to take ownership, what are the stumbling blocks they face that we could help remove that can accelerate the whole process? And I'd like to share with you today my insight into that effort. Learning math is like learning any acquired skill. It's basically a two-phase process. First phase is the knowing phase, conceptual understanding. Why am I doing it? What am I doing? That's the job of schools, and that's the load that teachers carry. But there's a second phase, which is the doing part. That's the practice piece where kids master internalize those skills. That's the load that kids have to carry. Now, when kids don't practice math, their load gets transferred back to you, and that's why schools have such a hard time in this country. Some of you who are principals may be carrying the load of 200, 300, 500, 1,000 kids that they should be carrying themselves. Now, trained as an engineer, I've always wondered, well, why don't kids like to practice math? They practice sports, they practice music. And the number one reason is they lack immediate feedback, which our physical senses give us in the realm of sports and music. Learning to ride a bike. You fall off, nobody has to tell you that when you lose balance. Playing baseball, swing the bat, miss the ball, your ears and your eyes will tell you. But when you shift over into a mental skill, like doing mathematics, our physical senses become useless. Now imagine if you asked a child to practice shooting foul shots in basketball. He's standing at the line, he's ready to go, and you take away his feedback loop. Put a blindfold on him, put earplugs in, he shoots the ball, can't see where the ball goes. Now, you wouldn't expect that child to stand there and do that activity for any length of time, because the minute you take away the immediate feedback, there's no opportunity for learning. And so what do you hear back? You know, I'm not too good at this. This is really frustrating. I'm bored. This is the, this is the feedback we're getting from kids in math, because we're asking them to do that activity with the blindfold on. Now, traditionally, what we've relied on for feedback is another live body teacher, parent, sibling, tutor, but as you know, live bodies are very expensive and not enough of us to go around. If you look at this next graph, the vertical line is time. And I looked at sports and music, and I say, how much time does it take for the teaching part of that? And how much time does it take for the practice part to, for you to really get good at that skill? And most of you intuitively and instinctively realize that the practice piece usually takes five to 10 times more than the teaching part. Now, if I spend more than an hour telling you conceptually how to ride a bike, I've talked way too long. At some point, you've got to get on that bike, you've got to actually ride. We're not duplicating this for our kids in math, because our kids are taught 40 minutes, sometimes an hour every single day. If they were practicing five to 10 times that, they'd be doing six hours of of math at home, and, and you know that's not going on. Not only are we not duplicating that, it's the uh, mirror opposite. 
The national recommendation in this country for homework is 10 minutes a day per grade. So by the time a student gets into sixth grade, it's an hour's worth of homework. But that hour is split among four or five subjects, and math allocation may be 10 minutes, 15 minutes. That discrepancy is why kids are having such a hard time uh, building a solid foundation in math. Now, when kids don't practice math, the downside isn't, oh, you know what, he's a little weak with his times table, or he doesn't really know how to handle fractions. <clears throat> Many of you have heard that algebra is the gateway in education, and it certainly is because it's the door opener for a lot of areas. If you look at the number of kids in middle school in this country who are proficient in algebra, which is very low, you would think that this is an incredibly complicated subject that only the Einsteins and brainiacs of the world can understand. But the concept of x as a variable that I'm going to assign a value to, that concept is very easy for kids to grasp. We have kids in kindergarten, first grade, second grade. It's basically a joker when you're playing cards. What do you want the joker to be? But to set this equation up and to solve it, kids must have mastered half a dozen what we call foundational skills. They got to know all the basic facts. They have to know how to handle fractions, decimals, negative numbers, exponents, and order of operations. Um, algebra is like an orchestra. It's the first time where these half dozen foundational skills have to come together and work together. So just like if you had a student who didn't practice violin, gets together in an orchestra, the, the outcome is going to be obvious. And by practice, you can master those six foundational skills. Once those six foundational skills are mastered, algebra takes on a completely different tone. Now, how much time does it really take in practice to get good at a skill? Well, Malcolm Gladwell, in his book, Outliers, talks about the 10,000-hour rule. This was based on 20 years of research by a fellow named Anders Ericsson, who studied people from all different fields. And the conclusion was, you want to become excellent at a skill, it takes, on the average, 10,000 hours of practice. Now, 10,000 hours is three hours a day, every single day, 10 years straight. And you don't have to be a mathematician to know that the odds of your children doing that is pretty close to zero. So what's the answer? Well, the answer is actually hinted at by a book that was published at the end of last year. It's called The Talent Code, written by an author named Daniel Coyle. Well worth the read. Coyle was fascinated by why was talent blooming in areas of the world that you would never expect, and he traveled to all these places to see what was the common element. I'll give you one example. Russia. Tennis club, no money, one indoor court, and yet they produce more top 20 world women tennis players than the entire United States. When he traveled to these places, he could only find one thing in common, and that is all the participants were engaged in what he calls deep practice. Now, deep practice is very different than normal practice, where you may just be mechanically going through the motions. Deep practice can only occur when a child is fully engaged, they made an internal decision to master the skill. The minute they do that, instead of constantly shying away from challenges, they're actually actively seeking them out. And if you give them the freedom to make mistakes without judgment, they're going to push their skills right up to the edge. They're going to end up screwing up a lot. But ironically, in all that messing up, they're getting faster, more competent, better at the skill. Now, the reason deep practice is important is it will highly leverage normal practice. What may normally take you three months to do, uh, through deep practice, you can do it in a matter of weeks, perhaps even a matter of days. And the reason is there's actually neurological changes that go on in the brain. Now, there's a lot of research coming out about the brain. And in fact, 95% of everything we know about how the brain works, we've only discovered in the past 10 years. And here's one of the things we found. You initiate an activity, rather it be sports with muscles, mental activity like solving math problems. It originates with neurons in the brain. Those neurons fire electrical signals. 
signals travel down a nerve fiber called an axon, impact other neurons. That neural activity is how we're able to master that skill. But what we found is that each time the signal travels down the nerve fiber, the body builds a sheath around that nerve fiber out of a living tissue called myelin. The more you fire, the more layers are built. They found exons with 50 layers of myelin sheath built around it. Now you may be sitting there and say, well, why is this important? Well, imagine if you send an electrical signal down a bare wire. It can get interfered, diverted, lose its strength. The myelin acts like an insulation, and what we found is that once a nerve fiber is myelinated, the signal strength can increase 20 times, the speed can increase 100 times, and the recovery rate from when it can fire again decreases by 35%, so it can fire much more rapidly. So when kids are undergoing deep practice, they're essentially building the equivalent of a broadband network in their brain, and they no longer have to operate at the old modem speed. Now here's the bad news about myelin. Nobody can do this for a child. You can have a teacher, a parent that can inspire, but the actual myelination process has to be done by the child themselves, taking ownership, being fully engaged, active learning. Here's the good news about myelin. Myelin doesn't care if you're rich or poor or what the color of your skin is. You fire those cells, it's going to build that sheath. Those of us who are in the education community, one of the issues that we're interested in nationally is closing the achievement gap. Largest area of concern right now is African American and Hispanic males. But you look in the area of sports, music, entertainment, African American males are world class, top of the heap. No issue about my nation. Because the physical senses serve that immediate feedback loop, if that child is motivated, they find an instrument, they find the ball, they can shift into deep practice. What we need to do as a society, as an educational institution, is to see how we can do that into the mental realm of doing mathematics. And this is why technology, properly understood, can play a paradigm shift in education. Now, most products that are out there are looking at education, uh, technology as an adjunct to teaching. Teachers used to teach on the blackboard, now they teach on, on the whiteboard. Nothing truly innovative. The real innovation of technology is the ability to supply that immediate feedback non-judgmentally, take that blindfold off very, very cost effectively. Now, <clears throat> A lot of people think that Asians are good at math. Well, I'm here to tell you, there's no innate gene, math gene, that Asians are born with. And the best, clearest proof to me is there are many, many times Asians who cannot do math in the entire population of this country. The Asians that you run into that are good at math, the reason they're good at it is because they practice. The Asian culture, Chinese culture, do not view learning as only the single phase. You know how much money and time in this country we've poured in, it's all into the teaching phase. If kids are not good at math, every five years there's a new way to teach math. Professional development, teachers have to go through everything, in the end, no result. Asians have always stood that there's a second component. Now, it's so understood, it's actually embedded into their culture and into their language. The Chinese word for learning is actually made up of two characters. The first character on the left stands for accumulation of knowledge. This little symbol down here is actually a, a symbol of a child. And it almost looks like a library on his head where he's accumulating knowledge. That's the first part. But there's a second character, and this second character stands for constant practice, as in little birds learning to fly. Now, I don't know of a single skill that you can get good at without practice, except for maybe breathing, even learning to walk. An average toddler at 18 months will take 3,000 steps a day. They'll fall more than 15 times. This is the learning process. Why should math be this exception, this outlier, where kids are going to get good, 
without doing the work, without myelinating the brain. Now, what the research shows is 90% of what a child learned is taught in school will be forgotten after 30 days. If you only concentrate on passive learning with accumulation of knowledge, we're essentially on a treadmill. The minute you put a piece in where you get the kids to carry their own load, take ownership, do the practice, now you're going to release a tremendous amount of energy. And my belief is if we want to impact the educational status of this country, we need to start paying more attention to this piece, which is child-centered, rather than this piece, which is teaching-centered. Now, teaching's important, but you can't run on one leg. Put that second leg in, you're going to have a tremendous difference. So thank you.